This is a production of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. God is at work in our Muslim neighbors. There's tremendous faith there in the God of Abraham. We find the flowers on the steps of the mosque here. Love letters from our neighbors saying, we love you. I believe that Christians and Muslims and Jews and other people of other faith can live together. Not only can they, they must. And welcome to Mosaic, the video magazine of the ELCA. I'm your host, Melissa Ramirez. We're in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the heartland of America. It is a place you'd expect to find Lutherans, but Cedar Rapids is also home to the oldest standing place of worship for Muslims in North America. People from the Middle East first came here in the 1920s looking for jobs, land, and a new life. Like their numerous Christian neighbors, they built a house of worship, the Mother Mosque. Some of those neighbors were Arabic-speaking Christians who helped their Muslim brothers and sisters start a new life in America. Today, the Mother Mosque serves as an Islamic cultural center. The world has over six billion people. More than a billion are Muslim. Followers of Islam are all over the planet. When North Americans think of Muslims, they often think of the Middle East, places like Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, and of course the land of Mohammed's birth, Saudi Arabia. But Muslims also live in places like Asia, South Asia, Africa, and the Pacific Rim. Indonesia has the largest Muslim population of any country in the world. Islam is a growing part of American culture as well. Some Muslims have been in America for generations. Others are new immigrants. Still others converted to Islam. Few Christians in America paid much attention to Islam before September 11. Today, the religion that reveres Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Mary is headline news. But what do North American Christians really know about Islam? Is what we know based on facts and experience, or fear and ignorance? This video will introduce to you the basics of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. We will go inside a mosque for Friday prayer. Then we will see how Lutherans and Muslims are working together to build bridges of understanding. Jews, Christians and Muslims believe in one God. We call this form of religion monotheism. The word Islam is Arabic for surrender. In religious terms, it means total surrender to the will of God. The word Muslim is related and means one who surrenders to God. It would be considered that all nature is Muslim. Uh, as far as human beings, uh, they have been given the uh, choice from God, or the free will what we call, and endowed this choice, whether they submit to God or they don't submit to God. Christians and Muslims have much in common. North American Christians use the word God. Arab Christians and Muslims use the word Allah, which is Arabic for God. Each religion values prayer, fasting, and giving to the poor. Both religions honor Adam, Noah, Moses, Abraham, Jesus, and Mary. 
In fact, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned more in the Quran than in the Bible. I think the important thing in these conversations is that we start with what is common. What is common as children of God, people created in the image of God, people who trust in God as our creator. And from there, then, we can move to share what we know in Jesus Christ as God's unconditional love. And that's a special message we have uh, to share with Muslims who much more hold in tension the mercy and the judgment of God. And our particular uh, message, and if we can live that in word and deed with our Muslim neighbors, is that God's love and forgiveness is unconditional. Islam has six basic beliefs. Belief in God, angels, prophets, holy books, day of judgment, and sovereignty of God. On these basic beliefs, they have established five pillars or acts of worship. Elements of each pillar can be seen in Christianity and Judaism. The first is to bear public witness. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. The second pillar is prayer. Muslims are asked to pray five times a day at dawn, noon, mid-afternoon, sunset, and evening. Fasting is the third pillar. This happens during the month of Ramadan. The fourth pillar is zakat, or almsgiving. In Islam, giving to the poor is a form of purification and worship to God. The fifth pillar is the hajj, or pilgrimage to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. If a Muslim man or woman can afford it, they are required to visit Islam's holiest sites at least once in their lifetime. In 2002, an estimated 2.2 million Muslims went on the Hajj. You basically are totally before God, in, in a sense that you are not a person of the world. You do not know even your own self. And millions of people they are praising to God in their own languages, in their own ways, some with loud voice, some with whispering, some crying. And it looked to me as if the bees are buzzing and all these humans praising to God. And I just one little drop in that. have a sense of wonder? Give voice to the wonders of God's work in the world. Consider public ministry in the ELCA. For more information, call 800-638-3522, extension 2870. Explore your sense of wonder. Prophet Muhammad was born in 570, nearly 600 years after Jesus Christ. At the time of Muhammad's birth, people in Europe were mostly Christian, and the church was the only universal institution. In Arabia, no single religion dominated the nomadic traders who roamed the desert mixing folk religions, Christianity, and Judaism. The Prophet Muhammad grew up in Mecca, a trading center on the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula. Prophet Muhammad was an orphan. Uh, this orphan became a great father for humanity. We sometimes think of Mecca as a, a little desert town, as though he came from the sand dunes, right? In fact, Mecca was quite a commercial city. He seems to have been a, a very bright chap. Um, he was given the nickname of El Amin, the trusted one. When Muhammad was young, the Kaaba, a small building in the center of Mecca, which Muslims believe was built by Abraham, needed repairs. When it came time to put back the black stone, a holy relic from the days of Abraham, leaders couldn't decide which tribe would receive the honor of replacing the stone. Elders agreed that the first person to enter the room would settle the dispute. It happened that Muhammad, peace be upon him, before his prophethood, was the one who entered first. Out of his wisdom, he suggested to put the stone in a large cloth, 
and have every representative of every tribe and family and community take a corner. And all of them shared lifting the stone, and then the Prophet himself moved the stone into place. And that way, he put an end to a dispute that would cause a big fight among the tribes. A rich widow by the name of Khadija noticed him and, it, and uh, offered him a job to take care of her caravans, which he did. And uh, he so impressed her that she offered herself in marriage to him. So he accepted. When he was 40, he had his first revelation. It was visual and quite impressive, I think, to Muhammad. The angel told Muhammad, Ikra, or read. This was a problem for Muhammad, who Muslims say was illiterate. So he would go home to his wife Khadija, uh, rather anxious and often very upset. And she comforted him. Muhammad continued to receive revelations. Sharing this revelation with family and friends, he said, there is no God but the one God. The revelations also spoke out against idol worship, slavery, and the practice of killing unwanted newborn female children. Local merchants and authorities were uneasy. Mohammed spoke of one, not many gods. As persecution increased, Mohammed sent some followers to Ethiopia, where a sympathetic Christian king took them in. While in Mecca, Mohammed experienced the night journey, or mirage. It was a spiritual journey with the angel Gabriel on the winged horse-like beast, El Barak. And that night, he moved by the miracle of God from Mecca to Jerusalem, and then went up to the heaven to see all the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set forth for him. Persecution in Mecca increased, then enemies plotted to kill Muhammad. And so the Prophet then received command from God as well as guidance that he must have to migrate from Mecca to Medina. And that is called the Hijrah, which is 622 of the Common Era. After arriving in Medina, a city north of Mecca, Muhammad settled local disputes, convincing warring tribes to submit to the will of Allah and become Muslim. While in Medina, Muhammad continued to receive revelations. One focused on the topic of struggle or self-defense. The Arabic word is jihad. And it was now, if you are still attacked and your followers are attacked, so Muslims have now the permission to defend themselves. That is where the jihad came in, that now you must struggle even to, if you have to take the weapons to defend yourselves, you can take now the weapon. Following a series of treaties and battles with invading forces from Mecca, Muhammad and the Muslim believers eventually conquered Mecca. Mecca then was conquered and Muslims were now in charge and free. Muhammad went back to Medina, made one more pilgrimage before 632, taught his followers, as it were, all the things that they do, what they're doing right now. They will all do exactly what Muhammad did on that last pilgrimage. They will follow his routine, his teaching, his example almost perfectly. They've kept it up for 1,400 years. How do you see the church? What about the world? Four times a year, Mosaic brings the view into focus. Mosaic, the video magazine of the ELCA. Now that we know a little bit more about the Prophet Muhammad and the origins of Islam, let's go inside the mosque. Out of respect for Muslim custom, I'm going to wear a head covering while inside the mosque. 
Hello, Imam. Hello. How are you? Very good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Well, thanks for giving us a tour today of well, the mosque. Welcome at the Islamic Center. Welcome to Cedar Rapids. Thank you. Before we begin the tour, maybe we should say something about what we're wearing, particularly my headdress. Well, actually, the, the headscarf, or we call it hijab, it's very much uh, um, an Islamic tradition uh, that uh, requires a dress code for uh, the, the lady that she must cover her body uh, and uh, nothing should be exposed except her face and uh, her, uh, her hands. Now we have brother Muhammad here with us. He's uh, our brother Muhammad. He's going to take uh, wudu or make wudu ablution uh, before the prayer. And he starts with the declaring the intention in the name of God. Then after that he wash his hands. Very good. Then after the hands he wash his mouth three times making sure that uh, to get out all the food or any little things between his teeth. Then after that he wash his nose and uh, that's just to make sure that he is cleaning very much whatever part that he must wash. Then after that he wash his uh, face uh, three times. And next he wash his hands arms up to the elbow starting by the right arm uh, making sure that he reached the, the elbow then the left arm then he takes some water and wipe his head uh, one time is enough then after that he wash his ears inside and outside we get to the last part which his feet which that he takes off his socks and shoes and wash his feet starting again with the right foot then his left foot and with that now he is ready to uh, go to the prayer room and pray now imam tell us about this section here i see a shelf and then another smaller shelf with some linens perhaps you can tell us what these things are about well actually uh, we are here in the sisters section where that they are uh, um, supposed to come here and take off their shoes put it uh, on the shelves and then for this uh, headscarves and uh, uh, the other things that's for the children uh, who uh, would like to join us at the prayer room then they wear the skirts and they join us and uh, uh, the prayer room is kept clean and uh, because we pr prostrate we bow and prostrate down and we put our head on the floor and we take off our shoes inside the prayer room uh, to pray to God and that's very much what the Bible indicates about Prophet Musa peace be upon him that he took his shoes off and, and he prayed to God when he met with him on the mountain very good Thank well you. why don't I join you inside yes, and please. I'll see you in a few minutes then you gonna enter oh. from here and I'll go to the other side very good thank, thank you, you. Now I see that there are no chairs in the worship space and that there are lines kind of dictating a direction. Now is this the direction in which they pray or could you tell us a little bit more about the space? All Muslims all over the world, they face Mecca in Saudi Arabia. We stand together as men in the front and sisters in the back, uh, no gaps, straight lines, and we all stand, we start the prayer standing, then we pray, we bow, then we prostrate, then we sit together. And uh, very much uh, uh, this system is made by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to give more uh, convenience to the sisters in order to feel comfortable while they are praying, that no one, a stranger, standing behind them or next to them. But at home you can pray next to your husband or brother or father. Tell us about this space over here. I noticed that there's a, a small carpet here and something on the wall. Perhaps you can share with us the significance of these. Correct. Well, actually, the prayer rug, uh, it's made for the imam, where he should stand to lead the congregation. And uh, everybody stands behind him. And uh, when he starts the prayer, he starts with call Allahu Akbar. Then all of them, they do the same thing. And the, no one moves to the next partition of the prayer before the imam does. This marble, it's just a design, a decoration. It's a beautiful Arabic written. It says Allah uh, and Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
in a Muslim country like Egypt or Turkey, you cannot miss the call to prayer while you are walking in the street five times a day. Thank you very much, Imam. After September 11, many Muslims and people of Middle Eastern descent came under heightened scrutiny. Fear and suspicion mounted. In response, Christians and Muslims worked very hard to foster understanding. Cedar Rapids, Iowa is about as middle America as you can get. It has 13 Lutheran congregations. Cedric Lofdahl is a retired ELCA pastor. These days, he works with the Cedar Rapids Interreligious Council of Lynn County, a grassroots organization that builds bridges of understanding between Christians, Muslims, and Jews. One way they build understanding is through a local TV show, Ethical Perspectives on the News. Right after 9-11, uh, we had three special half-hour programs which we had a Christian, the rabbi from the uh, temple, and the imam from the Islamic Center sharing about their concerns and reactions to what was happening. A lot of people don't realize how many other faith groups there are. And, and then realizing that those people are people just like us, have the same needs and concerns and so forth, and, and uh, are beginning to uh, appreciate that much more, I think. First Lutheran Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, is a leader in Christian-Muslim interfaith dialogue. They ask Muslims to speak in their church. Our visit to this large downtown congregation coincided with Ash Wednesday. Following the service, First Lutheran continued an ongoing series of presentations on Islam. Instead of speaking about Muslims, they invited Imam Ahmed al Khaldi to speak in person. I am the Imam of the Islamic Center of Cedar Rapids. It's only been in the past year or two that we really have been involved more with Islam, uh, particularly with the Interreligious Council here in town. We've had, since the beginning of the year, four classes, three adult classes and one class for high school youth to help us to understand the Muslim faith and the Islamic community. In those classes we've had opportunity for people from the Islamic community to be here and dialogue with our members. I'm impressed with the Islamic community here in Cedar Rapids. It, um, they have been very open to dialoguing with us and I think there are some uh, certainly misperceptions about Islam. This gives us an opportunity to put some of those stereotypes aside and realize that Islam is not the violent faith that perhaps we have come to believe because of the news. And God does not judge us according to our appearances, but according to our deeds, and He scans our hearts. Taha Tahwil is an Imam and director of the Mother Mosque. After September 11, he was touched by the Christian community's reaction. It was positive attitude toward Muslim in the state of Iowa. We did not have any major incident. In fact, uh, our neighbors uh, have been very, very much uh, supporting. Cedar Rapids isn't the only place where Muslims and Christians are working together. Dearborn, Michigan has the largest Middle East population of any city outside the Middle East. Rani abdul Masia leads an ELCA congregation of Arab Christians in this community where one in three speak Arabic. These Arabs aren't Christian converts. Their families come from ancient Christian communities in Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and elsewhere. The Christians at Abundant Life understand and are used to living alongside Muslims. The nature of Dearborn, which has about 96,000 in population, has about 35,000 who are Middle Eastern. Out of the 35,000, 90% are uh, of the Islamic faith. For Rani abdul Masia, a big part of ministry is building bridges with the wider Arab community. Rani doesn't go by himself. Members of Abundant Life are right there with him meeting with city officials. Whatever we can do as a city or as 
the assistant to the mayor in Dearborn, me personally, Joe Bidun, I'll be more than willing to accommodate you. Religious leaders, community activists. For us to sit back and say, well, they don't understand us, well, there is a responsibility that lies there. We need to try to make them understand us. And even the council general to the nation of Lebanon. It is through accepting the other with all the differences that that other might have is an essential step in building a better and a more positive future. I believe that Christians and Muslims and Jews and other people of other faith can live together. Not only can they, they must live together because we do not exist in isolation. Rather, we exist among people who are different than us. Jesus is the greatest example in breaking the barriers and that is because of the love that he has shown to the world. He broke all barriers of differences among people, whether it was ethnicity, like with the uh, Samaritan woman, for example, even the barrier of uh, gender uh, between women, males, females. It's no longer male or female, black or white, no longer Greek, Jew, I say no longer Palestinian or Israeli, no longer Arab or American. We are all one in the spirit that has brought us together, the spirit of love in Jesus Christ. It becomes an important role for the abundant life and for this our Christian community to take a leading role in building bridges in our community among people of other faith, especially the Muslim faith. We as Arabs, as Middle Easterns, have lived with Muslims. And as a Palestinian, I lived with Muslims and Jews as I was growing up. It's very important to bring those people together, to bridge the gaps, because I feel, especially in, in the recent events, uh, the gap is getting greater. Uh, and we need to build education and awareness about others. James had said, how can you love God whom you cannot see if you don't love your brother whom you can't see? It is a double standard, I believe, of any person of faith not to take action towards building understanding among our neighbors and among our community. The gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to a ministry of reconciliation. That means it is up to us to break down the barriers that divide people. We hope you have enjoyed watching this edition of Mosaic. The user guide that accompanies this video contains a list of resources to help you learn even more about Islam. Thanks for watching. This is Mosaic and you're part of it.